Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. It's good. All right, welcome back everyone to another Quantum Matter seminar. It's my pleasure today to introduce Denis Golesh from the Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana. Uh, and he's gonna be telling us about metastable phases in photo adopt uh, mod insulators. Thank you, Denis, uh, the stage is yours. Thanks, thanks Adrian. Thanks for, and thanks for the kind introduction and for the invitation. So yeah, today I will, I'll be this, I will try to discuss how to prepare long-lived states in photodop mod insulators and how then these things, how these states are distinguished from chemically doped uh, systems. And in particular, I'll focus on a theoretical description to describe modern spectroscopic tools like time-resolved X-ray diffraction or optical conductivity uh, to basically detect properties of these long-lived photodope states and how they distinguish from, the, from their equilibrium. And then in the second part of the talk, I will then focus on a material called calcium 2 rutinum 4 and I'll show that there is, exists a new metastable metallic phase. And the trajectory to this phase is actually pretty, uh, pretty uh, unusual as it includes the combination of non-thermal and classical metastability. But let's just focus now a little bit on what is what are metastable uh, phases. Uh -huh. So metastability it's a it's a phenomenon which is all around uh, around us. Like the most typical example, which you should know from uh, from uh, like classical physics, it's a supercooled water. So it's a phenomenon when you cool down water below uh, zero degrees Celsius and can still remain in the in the liquid form. Right? But then if you shake. Uh, this liquid, it can rapidly change into 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 the solid, into the ice. Yeah. So this view, this is a phenomenon which you can describe with uh, classical thermodynamics. Then there are more sophisticated uh, type of metastable phases like Rydberg atoms. So this is some highly excited uh, state of of the of the electrons, uh, which are which now form a large large type of an orbital. But it turns out that the Metric that for some of these highly excited states are actually very long lived because uh, their coupling with the environment is it's actually uh, they, they have just a small matrix element with other states and this protects uh, this gives them then, uh, a long life. Then. So this this is a really quant now a quantum quantum type of phenomenon. And final type of metastable phase which I would like to expose are driven metastable phases. So where we are using some external stimulus. To, uh, to, to drive the system. The most famous probably examples are Bose-Einstein condensation in exciton polariton. You're preparing exciton in some quantum wells as here. You're using an external laser pulse to excite the system. You're constantly pumping up in the energy and then you can basically stabilize for these excited states, macroscopic population of, of exciton polariton. So there are a bunch of uh, metastable uh, phases, and today I will mainly focus on those two classes. So the one which you can understand from standard thermodynamic point of view and pre-thermal state, which are coming from some kind of a almost conserved quantities, small coupling with other degrees of freedom. So let's see why it's useful to discuss classical, like why, uh, what, how in classical, um, uh, thermodynamic sense, we expect metastability. So it's, imagine that you're close to some kind of a first order phase transition. This means that in your free energy landscape, you will have a global minima and, and a local one. And now as in the water, you can, you can adiabatically shift one, from one to another, or you could imagine that if you're in its proximity, maybe you can use some rapid type of a photo excitation, which I sketched here. So you go from equilibrium to some highly excited day, and then some lando ginzburg type of evolution will just drive you to the, to the metastable phase. That's one expectation where we expect trap states to appear. The second setup which I have, which is more, um, more of a quantum phenomena, is, is that we can have a pre-thermal phase in a, in, because there are a bunch of conserved quantities in, in my evolution. So if I mark, my conserved quantity as QI, they commute or almost commute with the Hamiltonian, which means they will be conserved. And this leads to some constraint 
uh, for the evolution of the system. Yeah? There have been numerous examples in the in the literature about this kind of a pre-terminalized states. Like here, I'm exposing two of them. For instance, a recent study on a floquet-driven system for, for spin chains. So on the x-axis is the floquet cycle. On the y-axis is energy density, normalized from zero to one. One means basically infinite temperature state, zero means the ground state. Um, and obviously expect that if you pump energy in the closed system, system will heat up to, to the infinite temperatures. But what you can see that if there are some, uh, uh, if you have some kind of a almost conserved quantity in the system, this approach to the to the to the actual thermal state can be extremely long. Like there's the x-axis here is exponential, so I can live in a pre-thermal state for a very very long uh, time. So this is a Floquet case, but the one which I'll be really discussing today it's more of a MOT type of a pre-thermal state, and it's coming like. The motivation, one of the motivation comes from these early experiments on cold atoms, where they were just shaking the system. Um, their uh, cold atom type of experiment is, um, uh, is basically mimicking a Hubbard model. And they were measuring what is the lifetime of the photo uh, of these photo excite charge carriers as a function of the interaction strength. And what they observed, essentially, the lifetime scales exponentially with the interaction strength, which means that if the interaction strength is very large, we expect that we're going to have some very long lift, long lift charge, charge carriers. But obviously, its lifetime depends now how strongly I'm breaking those, uh, uh, how strongly I'm breaking the this conservation of, of some uh, conserved quantity. Now, as I said, most of the time I'll be focusing on the uh, on the MOT insulators. So let's see what what we actually expect, like pictor on a pictorial level for the MOT insulator. Like if I'm in equilibrium and I plot the spectral function, the lower Hubbard band is completely filled, the upper one is completely empty, or in real space because of the strong, very strong Coulomb interaction I'm having one particle per set. This is just the mod idea, uh, a pictorial view of the mod insulator, right? But now I'm photo exciting system recently between the lower and the upper Hubbard band, which creates charge carriers the type of excitations. And I'll call them Dublins if they're in the upper Hubbard band or holons in the lower hover band. So either doubly occupied or singly occupied in the, in the real space. And the point, the, the main idea when these objects are stable is when I'm, my Coulomb interaction is the largest energy scale in, uh, in the system. So that I would, yeah. So if the Coulomb interaction, the largest energy scales in my system, I can make some kind of schrieffer wolf type of a transformation to, uh, to, to construct like almost closer quantities, which in this case is just the number of doublons commuted with Hamiltonian and number of holons commuted with Hamiltonian. And now there are some correction terms. And these correction terms are now just saying to me that I can have a, many excitations of low energy bosonic degrees of freedom. Here I'm marking either magnon super exchange T square over U, or because some coupling with electron phonon type of interactions, which gonna uh, break this uh, uh, this conservation law, and since the bosons are now some low energy scales, I need a bunch of this high, some very high energy process to actually uh, to actually recombine uh, the whole and double pairs. And if you then try to evaluate uh, this, how does the recombination time looks like? That you see that um, it's basically uh, yeah one over the recombination time recombination rate. It's exponential in the ratio between the Coulomb interaction U and some characteristic boson energy of epsilon zero. So this can lead to extremely long, exponentially long lifetimes for the, for the recombination of this photo excited charge carriers. So this means that's a useful place to search for long for metastable phases. And this allowed me then to somehow map up some kind of a pictorial expectation, what we can expect for the evolution of the mod insulators. So this like x-axis would be time, y-axis is some measure of a distance from equilibrium. We start from equilibrium state, we create holons and doublons. And then if I'm having a small gap mod insulator, which means system will rapidly terminalize, I'm gonna go along the thermal way, cool down the system and create some kind of a hot thermal state. But there is another part, which the one which I'm gonna explore today is a large gap mod insulator, 
where the derecombination, derecombination of columns and doublons is suppressed. And I come to this kind of a non-thermal state, and I would like to understand what are the properties of this non-thermal state. How does the spectrum changes? What are these transport properties? How do we detect this in the experiment? And finally, like the, the real perspective, which I want to open today, that once you have this state stabilized, you can ask how it's going to interact with other symmetry broken uh, symmetry, uh, like orders in the system, symmetry broken uh, states in the system. And can it then lead to some kind of a non thermal hidden order? So, I've been most of the, most of the time up to now. I've been just discussing what uh, what are the mod insulator, but in practice, many of the material which I'll be discussing are not mod insulator, but are actually charge transfer insulator. So it's maybe useful to introduce this this notion. So in a mod insulator, I'm having some d orbital, and it would be non interacting. The system would be metallic. However, when you when you have a Coulomb interaction, which I mark here with u, which is larger than the bandwidth marked with w a mod gap opens between the lower and the upper hover band, and the system is an insulator. However, in the charge transfer insulators, there's a P band, some other band close to the D. And when the mod gap opens between the lower and the upper hover band, the P band is actually trapped between the two. This now also means that excitations of lowest order excitation, uh, lowest energy excitation, it's now from the P band to the upper hover band, which gives the name of charge transfer insulator, and thus, that's the, also the essence of the famous Zanin Savatsky Allen classification between the multi insulators and charge transfer insulators. So it's a different amount, number, like, it's really a different type of an excitation which I'm having in the systems. So, and this then give, brings me to my table of content, which is essentially as, as, as within this phase diagram, right? So, in the first part, I'll be focusing on this kind of a trapped non-thermal states and ask what kind of a what photomodify how I can photomodify electronic structure in, in charge transfer insulators and what are the properties of these states. So how can and then how I can experimentally really monitor this excited state? And I'll give you two examples on uh, X-ray absorption and uh, time result optics. And in the second part, I will then go even further along this line, and I'll tell you about uh, how we were able to detect a metastable uh, metallic phase in, in calcium rutinate. So let's start with how we are able, how photomodification of electronic structure in charge and free layers. What can we expect here? Well, there are, <clears throat> first we need to ask what kind of experiments are there to actually measure this kind of type of properties, right? And the first one which I want to expose is the optical conductivity. So we would like to check properties of the excited states. So this means that we also need the right, the right uh, technique. And the first one is that is optical conductivity. It's a rather simple probe. You're checking what is the absorption or transmission of the light. And these time resolve techniques are typically working this pump probe type of a setup where you first excite system with a strong pump. And then you come with some delay. At some delay, we come with the probe pass, and you're checking. And since we are optical conductivity checking transitions, probability for some certain transitions, now with the pump, we're gonna check how this how this uh, energy of these transitions uh, change or their intensity. The second uh, techniques, which is also sensitive to the unoccupied part of the spectrum, which I'll talk today, is X-ray absorption. So what's the idea here? Well, idea is that you shine in into your material with some very high energy X-ray uh, pulse. So this, and you excite ele electron from uh, some core levels to the unoccupied states. And this energy difference is of the order of kilo electron. So it's a huge energy scale in comparison to typical energy scale, which we are discussing in solid state. Okay? And then what X-ray absorption is essentially measuring is how much energy, how much how, what is the probability for such a for such a uh, excitation? But the real advantage, which is has, is that it is local, and you can make it element specific. Which means it really you can say this is the dynamic which is happening on my d orbital. This is the dynamic which is happening on my p orbital. So I have much more information than the typical, like in, for instance, in the optical conductivity. And this technique, it's now really 
like time resolve uh, X-ray absorption is really popping up uh, a lot because of the development of many, we get now many free electron, uh, free electron lasers. And it's also interesting because of connection with the other technique, which is the RIX, so resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, as it's actually the first step in the, in the RIX process. So those are, will be the two experimental techniques which I'll be mainly dealing today. And the first motivation for our work actually came from this nice experiments from the Mitrano group. Um, they took cuprates, like underdoped cuprates, like LBCO, 10% doped. And what they observed, and then they photoexcited. Yeah? And once again, they use X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and they observed an interesting phenomenon. So there is an intensity of the X-ray absorption as a function of the en uh, energy. The black one is the equilibrium one. The red one is the transient one. And what you see is that after they excite the system, there is a slight shift from the black to the red. So this upper hover, this peak which corresponds here to the upper hover band has been renormalized, while the peak which corresponds to the Zangre singlet is basically fixed. So this means that with light, we can now change the properties of the, of the, um, of the, of the upper hover band, right? Of the gap size, essentially. Um, what's the, like the, on the next, how long are these um, states lived? Well, in their case, it's actually an extremely short-lived uh, um, phenomena. It was the other hundred, several hundred femtoseconds. And the real question which I want to ask today, can we prepare some very long-lived renormalized band structure? We would just like to have something which lives on the long time scales in order that, um, that then one can really, this renormalized band structure can interact with the underlying orders, ordered states. And this, um, we can ask what's the origin of this, of this, why the states lives for such a short time, right? And the first thing which, is have, which we have to observe with them is they have 10% doped uh, uh, material, which means they're a bunch of holes, which acts as a, some kind of a, acts as an effective heat bath. So the smart way might be to start with a hot field system, which has no kind of an obvious uh, reservoir, uh, and then photo excite across the gap. And I should give here also a side remark. There have been also numerous uh, experiments in the group of Professor Dur on the nickel oxide, where they try to excite this system with a subgap type of an excitation, and they see much more, much smaller shifts or even there are some in some paper they were not detecting any shifts. Yeah? So this means that the shifts really strongly depend on how you're gonna excite your your uh, your system. So let's now try to build up into intuition from the theory point of view, what is would be a smart way to photo excite the system and what we expect from the shifts. But before first, I would like to just give you an background of what kind of a approach I'm going to use to describe these states. Yeah? So today I'll be mainly focusing on the theoretical technique, which is called dynamical mean field theory, which I'm going to illustrate on the, on the example of a Hubbard, Hubbard uh, model. So dynamical mean field theory, it's a statement that in the infinite dimensions, you can map the lattice problem to an impurity problem. So I'm sketching here a lattice problem, and then I can focus on one single set. And what you see is that hoppings, if I, I would like to integrate out all other sites, but what prevents me is that hopping connects me with the environment. Now, if I integrate all these other degrees of freedom uh, out, or other sites out, I'm gonna have get retarded action. And the retarded action is described now by a hybridization function. Yeah? It basically, and this means that I have mapped a lattice problem to an effective impurity problem, but the hybridization function for the impurity problem, I have to determine self-consistently. That's the essence of the techniques. So it's exact mapping in, in infinite dimensions, but at some on finite lattices, which I'll be using today, the approximation which you're using is that self-energy is local. But that won't be enough for our discussion because what is happening? So when I'm exciting uh, Holland and a Dublin, these are mobile charge carriers. They're gonna modify our, my transfer properties, but they can also modify the screening. So they can they will adjust to the electro, electrodynamic environment. 
And this means that I have to incorporate in the theoretical description also the information about, about screening. So how to include screening in dynamical mean field theory? Well, once again, example on the simplest possible problem, Hubbard model with non-local interaction, which I mark here with V, so it's an extension of the Hubbard model. And now what connects my single site with the environment, it's not only a hopping, but it's also non-local interaction. When I integrate out all other uh, lattice sites, what I obtain, it's an impurity problem, which has a self-consistency condition on the single particle and on two particle level. So I have to solve kind of a double, double impurity problem. Um, and then the, the information about the effective interaction, which is proportional basically to the electronic um, charge suitability, is giving me it's giving me now an information which charge excitations are now possible in the system. So I'm, I'm plotting an example in the mod insulator here. This is like effective interaction W as a function of frequency. The dashed line is the imaginary part, which is essentially saying that at zero energy, there are no excitation. System is gapped. Mod insulator is gapped for charge excitation. And the maximum for the charge excitation happens here at U at 10, which is exactly my U in the Hubbard model. So basically the charge excitations are across the mod cap. And then the real part, which is then the full line, it's essentially saying that the static interaction at high frequency is different than the instant uh, instantaneous interaction is, is larger than the static one. That's the essence of screening. My effective interaction, it's reduced because of uh, screening. And just for the purpose of this talk, I will actually go a step further and I'll ask, Okay, dynamic mean field theory is actually the best local type of approximation. What happened if I do correction beyond it to include non-local dynamical screening effects? And those non-local dynamical screening effects come in with such a diagram. So I'm really going step beyond the dynamic mean field theory and asking, is there a qualitative difference beyond, beyond dynamic mean field theory, which we obtain with such a low order expansion? In physical terms, this means it's non, it's uh, dynamical screening important for the description of photo excited charge carrier. That will be the main question. question yeah. Good. So as I said, I would like to describe charge transfer insulator. So let's see what is our model. I'm gonna all the time work, most of the time work with this Emery type of a model. I'm showing you here the example for the cuprates where I'm having a D type of an orbital, which is strongly interacting and p types orbital which are which are um, uh, which are filled yeah. and now there is a strong interaction on the d orbital which will open me up uh, up the gap there is a hopping between d and p uh, down here um, and so on and i'm just summing up here all the parameters the lanthanum copper oxide will be a 2d case while the second part i'll talk about nickel oxide which is a 3d generaliz generalization of this so let's see what we can expect from, from such, a, such a situation. Let's first have a look at the equilibrium spectrum. So here's a spectral function as a function of frequency. And uh, let's first focus on the red lines. The full line is marking me the D orbitals while the dashed lines are marking the P orbitals. And there, you have a bunch of structures in the spectrum. First, there's above the chemical potential, there's the upper Hubbard band up here. And below the chemical potential, there is first this band, which is traditionally called Zangrai singlet after the center work by Zank and Zank and Rice. It's an antibonding band of, of P band and the D band. Then there is a band which is predominantly of P character, this chunk here, and there is an, a bonding band down here. And the difference between the red lines and the black lines is just the difference between the DMFT and the diagrammatic extension, which I uh, explained you before. It's a question, how important is the screening for the description of the system? And what you see is system is an insulator and screening is not important, which means that those lines lie actually on top of each other. So this is what we would naively expect uh, that screening is not important in a large gap uh, insulator. And now I'm gonna excite the system. And I'm again excited with the frequency which is corresponding to this uh, to this uh, green uh, line here, and create a bunch of 
Dublin symptoms. Yeah? And I, I forgot to ask, if you have any questions, just don't, just interrupt me, right? No problem. So let's see what happens now after the cold excitation. So that's first what we have here on the top panel. The black lines are marking me the spectrum in equilibrium. Sorry. Uh, and, uh, Very yeah. You, any question? Are, are you playing a resonant pulse or sorry? Non are you playing a resonant pulse with the exactly? It's a, it's a resonant pulse which is having the frequency just as the one which I mark here with a with a green line. Yeah. Right. So it's a okay. short pulse but resonant between for this excitation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's creating bunch of bunch of bunch of excitations, eh? and. For the I don't know for the photo amount of photo excitation which comes to the order of uh, one percent, I get the following result. The black one is the equilibrium one, the red one is the is the non-equilibrium one, and what you can see is there is a small renormalization from the red to the black uh, from the black to the red, right? Which is slightly shrinking me the gap. What's the origin of this? Well, it's an electrostatic effect. Since I'm I'm photo exciting charge carrier from the P to the D. The, the upper hover band gets more negatively populated. The lower, uh, all the valence bands get positively populated. There is a charge transfer from P to the D. And this will create, because there is a Coulomb interaction between the D and the P, this will create uh, electrostatic attraction. And this electrostatic attraction then renormalize the uh, mid the band structure. And in terms of like uh, just a diagram, this corresponds to a Hartree type of a diagram. This is why these shifts are called Hartree shift. And you can then write just analytical formula for it, that how large is the shift. It's essentially proportional with the amount of the photodoping and the Coulomb interaction between the D and the P band. Good, so that's the first effect. But then if you look just down here and you ask, okay, what now happens if I go include non-local screening? You see that the effect is much more dramatic. We are going from black to red, and the gap, band gap renormalization is it's now much larger. And you, I should warn you that this energy scale is huge. This is of the order of half of electron volt. Yeah? Where we are having a large renormalization of the, of the band structure. But on top of it, you can see that these bands are also now strongly broadened up. Yeah? This means that we have strongly increased also the scattering with all this plasmonic type of, type of excitation. So photo excitation, then this means induced um, also strong lifetime effects. We're having renormalization of the band structure and strong lifetime effects. And the question which I'll be posing from now on, how can we detect this? How can we now experimentally measure this kind of a, this kind of a auto-induced changes? The first one is the, the most simple one, is the optical conductivity. So how I evaluate this optical conductivity is essentially I simulate uh, the system, and then I add, I simulate an additional small probe pulse explicitly. And it's really advantageous because in the diagram, this diagrammatic techniques, which I'm uh, here using, this explicit simulation of the additional probe pulse and measuring the induced current includes all the vertex corrections. So that's much more useful than using some kind of a bubble type of, type of approximation. But then if we look at the result, like optical conductivity as a function of energy, the black one is the equilibrium, the red one is the non-equilibrium uh, one, and you can see once again, there is a strong renormalization of the band gap and broadening of the, of the optical conductivity. On the right-hand side, I plot the difference between the equilibrium and the non-equilibrium one. And here I'm comparing it with the experiment which was done on the lanthanum copper oxide. So the, the theory was done for the lanthanum copper oxide, as well as the experiments. This was the experiment done in the group of uh, Daniela, Daniela Fausti. And you can see both of them has this characteristic feature up down, up down uh, type of a feature, which means there is a red bed, uh, red shift in the in the and the band uh, just, just the red band shift. Uh, the, so the uh, the gap gets smaller. Yeah. And for this, you need to obviously excite across, across the gap. And here, once again, I want to just point out, there is actually a pretty, like if you just measure those distances, like how large are the ship, it's a very nice agreement between the theory and the experiments. 
And this would never be the case when we only consider this kind of a static hearty type of a shift, but we really need to include the dynamical, dynamical screening. That your interaction is really screened down by photodope charge carriers. Good, that's optics. Now let's go to the case which, which, uh, which is uh, even more interesting for me because this X-ray absorption, as I said, it gives you information about exactly about one particular orbital. So I can measure how much is the gap change just because of the shifts on the D orbital. So if, as I have it down here, like I'm making an X-ray type of an excitation and because of the selection rules, delta J has the plus minus one, delta M plus minus one zero. I can excite either from core P band, which are now split it up because of the strong spin orbit coupling into three half and one half. And then I can have two types of excitation, which are traditionally called L3 and L2 edge in the, in the, for, uh, in the X-ray. And as I pointed out before, it's the energy scale for the, for the photo excitation, it's actually huge. Uh, like energy scale for this X-ray excitation, it's huge. These are kilo electron volts, which means that the measurement for the X-ray, uh, it can be actually decoupled from the low energy uh, dynamics in the system. This means that I can evaluate X-ray spectrum independently of my evolution in the low energy space. How is then this done in practice? Well, dynamical mean field, we perform a full dynamical mean field theory type of a calculation, as I explained you earlier. And then we, this means that this defined me a low energy impurity problem, as I mark here. So there's a deep impurity coupled with the bot. And now I extend this impurity problem with a core state, core uh, level. And those, that one is marked with epsilon c. It has some energy of epsilon c. And what this is actually a very, very non-perturbative effect because there is a strong Coulomb interaction between the core hole and the D electron, which you have to take into account because there is a formation of an exciton between the core hole and the electron in the, in the conducting band. And since there's a very large, large energy sc scale, we can approximate the X-ray uh, excitation in the rotating wave type of, of approximation. I'm having a dipolar excitation from core to D, but in a rotated rotated frame. So the, the energies are just shifted from the of the incoming X-ray with respect to the to the to the core level. And this, there, there we are using certain a certain envelope which is marked with S of T. So this this means that X-ray evaluation it's now really a post-processing type of description. So what, uh, what do we get uh, if we try to evaluate this? So here it's the uh, first result, like X-ray absorption as a function of frequency. In equilibrium is the black line. It has basically two main features. The first is this kind of a large excitonic peak, which is really an exciton between the core hole and the valence uh, uh, conducting ele electrons in the conducting band on the d orbital only. And there is this additional peak here, which is a continuum state. So these two particles are now decoupled from each other. And now I can ask what happens if I'm further photo exciting the system. We are going in this from red to a violet. And on the right hand side, I'm then plotting how does the x, this excitonic peak changes after the photo excitation. And what you see, it always has this kind of a down up down structure, which is saying my X-ray, uh, my exciton is moving to the lower energy. And this is now a explicit measure that only the upper hover band is, is moving. Only the D orbital has moved because I'm sensitive, X-ray absorption is only sensitive to the, to the D orbital. Yeah? And on top, there is a broadening of this continuum with the increasing of the photo excitation. Okay. So then, then um, our experimental friends did the uh, from the Duisburg. So this uh, group of uh, Andrea Aschenlor from Duisburg, um, they did similar this type of an experiment on the nickel oxide, but now at half filling and excitation across the gap. So they have to use rather high pump excitation. And I'm not sure what this oxygen is doing here. It should be not oxygen, but of course the nickel. Um, so, and they measure the changes on the nickel LH. This is this main excitonic resonance, which I've been pointing out before. And the difference between the ground state and the pump one, you can't really see on this level, but if you plot the difference between them, 
you start with dots here, you see once again, this kind of up-down up down feature, there's a redshift of the L, uh, L3 edge. And then you can just try to model this. And what this modeling means is really just a rigid band shift of the of the excitonic of the excitonic resonance, and you can see that roughly the rigid band shape reproduced reproduced uh, 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 the experimental data. But the nice, the real nice thing is that now you can measure how long clip is this state, and it's living extremely long. Like here's a change in the X-ray absorption as a function of delay time for different excitation strength. Like those data are for the nickel L3 edge, and you can see that the change is essentially living on more than tens of picoseconds. So it's extremely long this state. Now this is the point where one could hope that, to get some kind of a non-trivial new order phases. Good, how does this compare with the experiment, uh, with the theory? So I'm doing the same type of a theory as before, um, uh, just measuring the shift in this excitonic resonance. I, and here on the right hand side, I compared the change in the X-ray absorption as a function of frequency. The red line is the theoretical data, just the calculation. The dots are the experimental data. And what we observe is that the, for the same amount of the photo excitation, the shifts are very comparable, right? Once this dynamical screening kits include, but the broadening it's not. And then if we would then artificially broaden the theoretical data, then we would come to this dashed line down here. And this means that there has to be some additional source of the broadenings of the lifetime effects, maybe some coupling with uh, uh, bosonic modes in the in the experiment, which we want still need to take into account to get a more a more uh, precise uh, agreement. But nevertheless, we were extremely happy that we understand now that the real randomization of the upper hover band, it's one can really point it out just to the dynamics of the of the d orbital. Good. So that's the message of the first part, where basically I was saying that after the photo excitation, one can dynamically change the screening. And what happens is that when then one can detect this kind of a, the renormalization of the band, either by optical experiments or, or X-ray absorption experiment, which are the excellent probe for this. And at the half field case, one can produce an extremely long lift long, uh, long lift state, which can last between 10 and hundreds of picoseconds. So this gives us now the motivation. Okay, we understand that we can be nice. To... May I ask yeah. a question? Uh, so for for this dynamical screening, do, do you? My 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 impression is that you necessarily need a a, a, a v a nearest neighbor's v um, yeah. together. Exactly. Is that yeah. correct? Without the v, yeah. You don't... In, in this in my particular case, it's actually more the most important term is actually dp interaction. So interaction between the D and the P orbital, like it's the nearest neighbor, but yeah. Right, right exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah, I see. Okay. That, that one is the dominant parameter in the theory. Yes, yes. Okay. It determines how large is the renormalization. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So as I said, now we are somewhere around here. We are we understand how to photo photo modified electronic structure and how to then detect them. Right. And the next step. It's now to go to the symmetry broken phase. Can we somehow co op? Um, yeah. Can we somehow stabilize some states which are not present in equilibrium phase iron? And I'll show you this example on calcium rutinate. So, what's the cal what's, what do you have to know about calcium rutinate? It's once again a correlated system made of such an, octa there's such an octahedra. And it has four electrons in three to two G orbitals as a marking. So naively, we would expect that system is an it's a metal. However, as and this is indeed what is happening at the low at high temperatures. But as you reduce the temperature, system undergoes a structural phase transition, where the C axis, which is what they are like here, this would be the C axis, has a phase transition from a long C x C L x length to the short. So there's some kind of a stretching of the C axis. And this has a consequence on the orbitals because one of the orbitals is then pulled down in energy. It gets fully occupied. But now there are two electrons in two TTG orbitals and they can undergo the mod transition. And that's the, then the microscopic origin of the low temperature insulating, insulating phase. Now, which means that we have a bunch of coupled order parameters. First of all, is this kind of an orbital order? 
which I'll call a charge disproportionation here marked with phi, and it's one in the low temperature insulating phase and zero in the in the metallic phase. Then there's we have I have a structural order which is marked here, and I have on top of it mod and point physics. So then you try to ask, what is the low energy effective theory, which I'll describe for this, I'm kind of a lando Ginzburg theory. But let's see how this order parameters are coupled. I'm having lattice distortion marked here with Q3. It is linearly coupled with a, with a charge disproportionation, so orbital order. And then what our, um, our colleagues from uh, the group of Andy Millis did, they basically did a uh, full DFT plus DMT, some kind of ab initio type of simulation for the calcium rutinate to determine three parameters in this, in this lando Gilbert type of a theory. Since it's a first order phase transition, I can also have this kind of a cubic term. Right? And then they extract, they extract from first principle these this three parameters, and the landscape which emerges is something like what I plot here. On the x-axis is the electronic order parameter, on the y-axis is the lattice. And we have a low temperature insulating phase here and a high temperature metallic phase. And there's a there's some kind of a, a, a cross, a, a saddle point between them. And this is kind of a first order, it's really this kind of ideal first order phase transition scenario where you would expect that one can stabilize a non-thermal phase. Let's see if this is then the our motivation. Is this possible? Yeah. So there was this, then our experimental colleagues from Cornell, so the group of Andre Singer, did the following experiment. So they take calcium rutinate and they put it on the epitaxially strained film. These are thin film type of experiment, and then they excited with one point, standard 1.5 EV. And they measure how does the lattice change by time result X-ray diffraction. And here are the first results, like intensity, this is basically just the Brack peak. And the Brack peak, which you're seeing here in equilibrium, is the black one. And after the photo excitation are those red and green one. And what you see here are two things. First thing, that the C-axis has expanded because there is a shift of the Brack peak. The second thing is that intensity of the Brack peaks has changed. And the intensity of the Brack peak is essentially a measure of lattice fluctuations in the system. This means that also fluctuations has changed in the system. And final thing which you have to observe is also that the distortion stays there on tens of picoseconds. So it's a very long lived distortion. Systems do not recover to the equilibrium states on, on very long time in comparison to electronic type scales. Is this really a non thermal state? Let's see what the experiment says. The first thing we did plot is the intensity of the Brack peak and the change in the C axis distortion. For the thermal case, which are the bl black dots down up here, and they follow a certain trend. And you see that there is now, but then for the photo excited state, the trend tend to trend in two different regimes. There is for weak photo excitations, the Brack peak is essentially staying down here. It's changing in intensity, but it does not change the C axis length. While for there exists some kind of a critical excitation strength, which is marking the activation dynamics, where the C axis start to change a lot, right? It's comparable with the high temperature state. However, the intensity of the Brack peak is completely different. This means that we have stretched the system. However, it, is, it has different fluctuations of the, of, the, of the lattice. So this tree now pointing out has a strong signature of a, of a very non, of a non-thermal state. Yeah? Can we get more information out of it? So they also did an optical type of experiment, like, opt, like high energy optics 1.5 EV change. It's marked here with red as a function of time. And you see that optics rapidly rises up on there within their time resolution, and it stays there distorted on hundreds of picoseconds. Same as the X-ray intensity, it rises up on the time scale which the signal needs to propagate across the sample. And then once again, it just stays in the distorted, distorted uh, situation. And the final important thing is, is the system still an insulator or is it metallic? And this is checked by measuring the terahertz optical response. You're measuring, measuring is there a Druder response? This is this blue line here. 
And indeed, what you see as a function of time, there is a slow rise up of the Druda, of the Druda peak happening on several tens of the picoseconds. And it's also trapped on hundreds of picosecond time streams. So the system starts to get metallic. There seems to be some kind of a non-thermal metallic phase happening in the system. So what we can ex explain about this um, uh, from the theory point of view. So um, what I did was a dynamic mean field theory type of calculation for the for the, this three T2G orbitals on the beta lattice for the for simplicity. So I have to treat one has to treat full slater Kanemori type of type of interaction. And on top of it, I'm having electron lattice interaction. Lattice is marked here with two, Q, three, and phi is the electronic order. And I'll treat lattice on the classical level just because it's it's um, uh, the low, uh, the lattice uh, dynamics. It's uh, the lattice energies are much smaller than the than the uh, the electronic energy scales. And what you in equilibrium, what you see already on the on the atomic level though is that dxy orbitals get pushed down because electron phone interaction, but the other two are degenerate. And then if you plot the spectrum as a function of energy, you see that this is the red line, which is completely filled, which is just the dxy uh, uh, orbital. There's a blue line, which is opening up the, the mod gap up here. Um, system is an insulator with a fully filled dxy orbital. And now I'm exciting once again recently between the lower and the upper hover band. I'm going to try to wrap up in a, in a minute or two. Yeah. Um, so then you photo excite the system and ask what is the response of the, of the, of the lattice. This is Q3 as a function of time for different type of photo excitation. The blue one is the equilibrium excitation. The green one is the, like, is the very small excitation. So it's just oscillating around the equilibrium. While if you excite the system more strongly, there is a strong deviation from the from the equilibrium position of the lattice. And then this has obviously effect on the electronic order, or then you can plot electronic order parameter as a function of time. See that if you're excited weakly, it just oscillates around equilibrium. But for strong excitation, what happens is that there is a drift toward the metallic phase. I, order, I remember that the phi zero is the really would be the metallic phase. So this drift is pointing out the system, it's approaching to some kind of a non-thermal non -thermal metallic phase. And we can use the slope of this drift. Obviously, now we are limited by time propagation, but one can use the slope of this drift to see what is the tendency of the system for approaching this metallic phase. Um, so I plot this drift as a function. Yeah. Uh, how do you introduce the coupling uh, between the, the, the electric field and, uh, and the lattice? Yeah, so it's, it's basically um, just an electric field and the lattice. No, the, there is no coupling between the electric field and the lattice. I'm exciting electrons across the gap, standard piles and piles, all right. dipolar type of excitation, actually. Yes. Yeah. And there is a, now a charge transfer between D and P, which right. is modifying my charge disproportionation order parameter. And this creates a force on the lattice. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's, no. a, it's, a, it's a charge transfer force on then on uh, created on the lattice. Yeah. And the dynamics of the lattice is classical. It's classical. This is a purely classical uh, dynamics. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Good. So I'm having this long time drift. And what we observed is first that there's a big difference between the bulk and the tin film. Uh, we can go into details of it. Of it. But what is now interesting here is that you try to you can try to put different trajectories into the Lando Ginzburg type of a phase diagram. And you can see that for weak excitation, which is this red one, you stay within the insulating phase. But for strong excitation, there's this green line, you have some very strange slow wiggles happening. That's the last thing which I want to point out. What is actually happening here? After the photo excitation, your holon and Dublin number is conserved quantity. And it can be only, this means that it gives you constraint on the dynamics. There wouldn't be any electron lattice couplings. This would be just, a, they would be basically frozen. However, because lattice is now able to move, it is slightly broken this conservation law, which means that now in this sense, electrons are now basically frozen up 
and all the dynamics is governed by this lattice deviation. Yeah? And these are the strange wiggles in terms of the Lando Ginsburg, which are following completely different dynamics, which you would expect from if you would be solving time dependent Lando Ginsburg type of theory, just because there are cons microscopic constraints coming from the conservation of Dublin and Holland up here. So this means we have kind of a mix of a classical and a pre thermal type of a metastability. That's what I try to then sketch in this kind of a diagram. We are photo exciting, but we are not really following the standard Landau Ginsburg type of uh, dynamics, but conserve quantities it actually deviates us in the other way and creating the lattice is now governing uh, our dynamics. Good. With this, I conclude. So in the first part, I was basically showing you about photo manipulation of electronic structure and how you can use X-ray absorption to, uh, to detect it in, and give you an example of nickel oxide. And the second part, I was talking about metastable phase in calcium rutinate and uh, stabilization of the metallic phase. Just uh, thanks to the collaborators, X-ray absorption were done uh, in the group of Andrea Aschenlor and Uwe Bovenzitten, and the theory was done together with Philip and Martin. And this calcium rutinate uh, metastable phase was done in the group of Andre Singer together, and the theory was done together with Andre uh, Andy Millis. And we decide thank you for your attention, and I'm open to all of your questions. All right. Actually, you have a live audience, so we thank you for a very nice talk. So now it's uh, time for questions. Yeah, I was a bit longer than I expected. Then. I don't know. That was it. Was it was perfect for from our end. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just had a question. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, when you were looking at the spectrum, I think you could clearly see the uh, the Zangrai singlet state. Uh, I'm just wondering: is there were, were there any other? Uh, I was kind of in between, but were were there any other kind of um, triplet states seen at all in between the spectrum when you when you were looking at the um, mm -hmm. so. This like I was I was dealing with uh, with uh, uh, the the example which I was showing was for the lanthanum copper oxide which which has essentially yeah. one hole in the d in the d orbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you would be going to the to the nickel oxide, there you're having two electrons in the in right. the d orbitals because the Hund physics they can form a high spin states. Yeah, and that's the place where you would expect. Right, 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 right. Okay, thank you for uh, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Hey Dennis, it's good to see you. Um, oh, hey. Hey, Alberto. I have a question about the nickel oxide. Uh -huh. That three point was it three point seven eV pump? Something of this, yeah. So that's supposed to go across gap, right? Four point seven. So 4. it's 7. it's even higher excitation than the optical gap. Yeah. How do we know what character those states have? Sorry. So what, what type of resonance excitations are we doing? Do we know? Or is it just from, are we targeting no. some orbitals? Are we? No, I think I think this was just a convenience. So they just had this type of a setup there. Right. Um, but like, like I can I can answer you with a like zeroth order theorist point sure. of view. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Zeroth order theorist point of view is that you have to excite across the gap. Yeah. There's going to be, Definitely some dissipation channels, which gonna yeah. bring the uh, charge carriers to the edge of the gap, yeah. and there there is a bottleneck. Yeah? Okay, so maybe the, the I'll buy that. Yeah, yeah, the, I'll buy that. yeah. Okay. Of the of the gap does not uh, of the excitation does not really matter, right? Okay, that would be zero to order. But I, then mm -hmm. this idea from Mitranos from Mateo's paper that they renormalize U is mm -hmm. that really the Coulomb U or just just affecting all the um screening in the system without really uh, look that's what I I try to be implicit there, right? I have okay. my own thoughts about this, yeah. Yeah. But essentially I think in my point of view, it's like this. When you're in the multiband situation, uh -huh. as we are always are, they were considering basically a single band type of idealization. Yeah. yeah. When you're in the multiband case, I'm first of all making a charge transfer excitation. Right. Surely I'm going to get those hard to shift. Right. It's a first order type of thing. The second order type of 
uh, of contribution are those dynamical screening, which is essentially reducing Q. That's what Mitano right. is essentially saying, that I'm effectively reducing it. Sure. I'm saying we have both of them. It is very hard to separate them. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, we just now have, we just have two things which are cooperating, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting question, like conceptual question, how we could separate the two. Right. I don't right. have an answer to this question. I don't even imagine how this would be done. Like, we have some really ideas actually. And I think RICS plays a very important role. Uh, in this. RICS, I agree. RICS is an option. RICS yeah. is an option. I agree. I agree. So that if you would be able to follow plasmons and plasmon uh, normalization after the photo excitation, I agree. That yeah, I think cool. XIS doesn't give you enough information. I think you really yeah. need to look I, at the photo I, I agree with this. Yeah. 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 RICS would be an option. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Sure. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Please feel to unmute yourself. Yeah. All right. If not, we thank uh, Dennis one more time. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate it. We stay in touch. Great talk. Bye.